Good morning and welcome to the press conference for the 56th Annual Society of Thoracic Surgeons meeting in New Orleans. I'm Robin Cohen from the USC School of Medicine. The next uh, presentation is entitled National Landscape of Aortic Valve Replacement in Young and Middle-Aged Adults, Clarifying the Current and Potential Future Roles of TAVR. It will be presented by Dr. Jennifer Nelson from the Nemours Children's Health System in Orlando, Florida. Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. I'm Jennifer Nelson. I'm a congenital heart surgeon at Nemours Children's Hospital in Orlando, and I'm also an associate professor of surgery at the University of Central Florida College of Medicine. I'm also the workforce chair for the STS workforce on the surgical treatment of adults with congenital heart disease. For some background, aortic valve replacement is a commonly performed operation among young and middle-aged adults. But within this group, there is a growing population of adults living with congenital heart disease and they often require repeat valve operations during their lifetime. But in the context of recent guideline modifications and expanded indications for transcatheter valves, the landscape of aortic valve replacement in adults is shifting. Given these developments, it's important to understand clinical outcomes by valve type in the young and middle-aged adult population, as current practice patterns and early outcomes for these groups are unknown. Therefore, we aim to describe valve utilization and early outcomes by valve type for adults less than 55 years of age, including that subgroup of patients with congenital heart disease. To accomplish this aim, we designed the study to capture all AVRs performed between 2013 and 2018 that were recorded in either the STS Adult Cardiac Surgery Database or the STS Congenital Heart Surgery Database deduplicating the records between the two databases came first, followed by extensive variable mapping that we used to merge the data sets, and we tried to rely on similar variables when feasible. Our outcomes were 30-day mortality and a composite measure of morbidity that included renal failure, persistent neurological deficit, reoperation for any reason, and readmission within 30 days. Congenital patients comprise 16% of the overall cohort. This subgroup was defined by having either a case record in the congenital heart surgery database, a history of a prior congenital cardiac operation, congenital valve disease as the indication for AVR, or a concomitant congenital operation. We use standard statistical methods to assess the outcomes including univariable comparisons and multivariable regression analyses. Women form the minority of this cohort. When the congenital and non-congenital groups were compared, several important differences emerged. Most notably, the congenital patients were younger, which was not too surprising, but they also had a significantly higher rate of prior sternotomy and they had more frequently undergone prior aortic valve replacement or repair. STS defined risk factors for the overall cohort are presented here, including the proportion of patients with active endocarditis at the time of surgery, moderate to severe chronic lung disease, or those who were on dialysis or in shock at the time of their AVR. When the congenital and non-congenital groups were compared, the congenital patients had a similar distribution but lower rates of these measured risk factors. As far as aortic valve dysfunction, pure aortic insufficiency or leakage at the aortic valve was the most common type of aortic valve dysfunction. In the congenital group, valvar aortic stenosis was most common or a narrowing of the valve. Other valve dysfunction listed here included subvalvar, supravalvar, and multi-level obstruction. Overall, bioprosthetic valves were the most commonly implanted type followed closely by mechanical valves. TAVR, homographs, autographs, and Ozaki or surgeon fashioned valves accounted for approximately 3% of aortic valve replacements in this population. In the congenital group, mechanical valves were used most frequently. 
and autographs or the Ross operation alone accounted for 3% of aortic valve replacements. Just to put some numbers around what we're talking about for TAVR in the congenital population, there were only 39 total TAVRs performed for congenital patients over this study period. Valve use over time is shown here for the years where we had complete data for that year. Bioprosthetic valve use increased while mechanical valve use remained relatively stable. During the same time period, TAVR utilization also increased. 46% of our cohort had an isolated AVR, while 12% had concomitant cabbage and 5.5% had um, concomitant annular enlargement. The overall mortality rate for our entire cohort was 3.6%, and this figure shows the 30-day mortality by valve type. The highest mortality was associated with homographs, and the lowest mortality was associated with autographs. TAVR mortality was similar to that of bioprosthetic SAVR. In order to facilitate further comparisons between SAVR and TAVR, we elected to present results for isolated AVR as well as for the congenital subgroup. As expected, when all AVRs were compared to isolated AVRs, the isolated AVR procedures, procedures had a lower 30-day mortality, and they had lower rates of our composite endpoint for morbidity. When congenital patients were compared with non-congenital patients for the same outcomes, similar patterns were noted for mortality and morbidity, although among the TAVR patients, morbidity for congenital patients was higher than among the non-congenital patients. This table displays the multivariable risk factors for mortality. Notably, non-mechanical valve types were associated with a 1.2-fold increase in mortality compared to all other valve types, including TAVR. Among the multivariable risk factors for our composite morbidity outcome, both bioprosthetic valve type and larger implanted valve size were protective. Interestingly, um, use of a homograph valve was also protective after adjusting for these other factors. This study was unable to assess reasons for valve selection or patient eligibility for particular valve types, for instance, the Ross procedure, which requires a pulmonary valve coming from the patient to be reimplanted in the aortic position. In congenital patients, that may not be possible. Also, this study was limited because several important AVR endpoints were not assessed, and those include functional recovery, quality of life, following different types of valve operations, paravalvar leak, and hemodynamic studies after different types of valve replacements. Also, there is an ongoing question of durability when we're talking about TAVR valves um, over time. So in conclusion, valve utilization is evolving. The majority of young and middle-aged adults receive bioprosthetic valves, and bioprosthetic valve use is increasing. TAVR use in this population is rare, but it's also increasing. Our data suggests that the probability of death is lowest for mechanical valves. However, the risk for morbidity was lowest with bioprosthetic and homograph valves, which potentially validates some of the strategies we're using now to manage uh, salvage or emergency situations or endocarditis. Congenital patients are unique, but challenging to triage as far as trying to match them with the most appropriate valve type because certain characteristics in this population would favor TAVR, while others argue against its use. So in this population, a prospective trial is needed to refine optimal patient selection and to help us match patients to their most appropriate valve type. In the meantime, we'll continue to work on harmonizing variables within the STS databases and establishing more clear criteria to define what is adult congenital heart disease. We also think it's important to, to study factors that are at the center or hospital level, such as the case volume that's done there, the type of hospital system, freestanding children's hospital versus academic medical center, and surgeon experience. And so all of these things will be valuable efforts moving forward. 
I wanted to pull out a couple of points specifically addressing the issue of sever or surgical aortic valve replacement versus transcatheter aortic valve replacement. When we look at the outcomes of mortality, morbidity, length of stay in days, and stroke rate specifically for SAVR versus TAVR in this study, we saw a, a lower rate of 30-day mortality for surgical aortic valve replacement, although this did not reach statistical significance. Morbidity rates were similar as well. However, there was an important difference in length of stay for SAVR versus TAVR. The difference that we picked up in this study was a length of stay median of four days for TAVR and six days for SAVR. But it's important to understand that as time has moved on, we have moved away from general anesthesia for mo many of these TAVR procedures, and so the length of stay is still decreasing. The stroke rate was significantly different between TAVR and SAVR. The SAVR stroke rate was 0.9%, significantly lower than the 2.4% stroke rate seen with TAVR in this database study. Just to summarize, we know that mortality is lower for isolated versus non-isolated aortic valve replacement. Mortality in this study was lower for isolated surgical aortic valve replacement versus isolated transcatheter aortic valve replacement, but it did not reach statistical significance. Morbidity was similar, and the length of stay was shorter for TAVR. Looking at risk factors between these groups, the risk factors listed in red increase risk of morbidity and mortality for TAVR, while those listed in green tend to decrease the risk. So you can see that it is possible these are canceling each other out and um, resulting in um, those results as far as the morbidity and mortality and not seeing TAVR emerge as, an, as a risk factor in the adjusted analysis. We looked at other outcomes as well. As far as new pacemaker placement rates, SAVR 3.7% versus TAVR 3.6%, no significant difference. There was no difference seen in the elective versus urgent or emergent case status, but the procedural duration for TAVR was significantly shorter as expected. Just to summarize for the congenital subgroup, these patients are younger. They have fewer measured risk factors. Prior sternotomy is more common. Elective cases were more common. Valvar aortic stenosis or narrowing at the level of the valve was more common. And they had a lower 30-day mortality and lower composite morbidity rate when compared to the non-congenital patients. These are the most common reasons or indications that we would use a particular valve type or that reasons that these valve types were used in this study. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, so I get the pleasure of discussing this uh, study, and I must say that it's, it's so comprehensive that a discussion could take a number of different directions. Uh, Dr. Nelson and her associates from Orlando and Cleveland have done a beautiful job of defining the landscape for aortic valve replacement in younger patients, and also of initiating the conversation regarding the application of transcatheter aortic valve replacement to not only younger patients, but some patients who may have congenital heart disease. Uh, the fact that uh, TAVR is disruptive technology for the treatment of aortic stenosis in old patients is indisputable. I mean, nobody can compete with the excellent short-term results, routine hospital stays of 24 hours in many centers, and a procedure that's practically incisionless and, and hence virtually painless. I mean, um, why wouldn't all patients want them and why wouldn't we want to give that to them? Uh, but the authors make several very important points, uh, the most important being that the results of surgical aortic valve replacement in younger patients are excellent and sometimes superior to TAVR, uh, that a significant number of younger patients with aortic valve disease have pure aortic insufficiency or some kind of disease that would not make them amenable to the current TAVR devices. And uh, the issue of durability in TAVR in younger patients is going to be really important. The, uh, the issue is so important in younger patients because bioprostheses um, are known to degenerate more rapidly, resulting in the potential need for 
multiple valve replacements in a patient's lifetime. And to complicate matters more, I don't think that we really know what the treatment of failed TAVR is going to be. Is it going to be put a new TAVR inside of an old TAVR, or is it going to be an operation that has the potential to be more complicated than the initial operation by virtue of the fact that that TAVR sits in the aortic root and may be difficult to get out? So I think that the authors very importantly point out that there are many surgical options for young patients in need of aortic valve replacement. Uh, no one doubts that the role of TAVR will increase with increased clinical experience and the evolution of the devices. Uh, but having said that, I, I think the young patient cohort is going to be the, the one that really calls for increased patience among not only physicians, but increased reason among surgeons and potentially even parents until we really have some long-term data that, that tells us uh, not only the long-term results, but how we're going to treat them when they fail. Uh, so with that, do you, do you want to come back up and, uh, and I'll, we'll let you take the questions. Yes. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Maxwell with TCTMD. I'm just curious what kind of future research you'd like to see in this patient cohort moving forward. Thank you for your question. Um, as far as future research, I think there were several areas that we left unexplored and several areas that were not possible to explore with our database method. Um, one in particular, or a list in particular, of things that still need answers is the, the residual rates of leakiness around the valves or paravalvular leak. Um, following the different types of valve replacements. We need to focus a little bit more on this question of pacemakers, which is different than the rates we're seeing in the adult trials. Um, but one of the most important things I think that we're going to need to apply future research methods to is this understanding of functional recovery and how does that play in to TAVR versus surgical aortic valve replacement and how long does that last? So over a child or a young person's lifetime, they may need multiple valve replacements. So just because we choose the optimum valve now doesn't mean that decades later, the patient and the providers are going to be happy with that choice or not wanting to wind the clock back and see if there's something we could have done better. So longitudinal follow-up through interaction with the patients, patient report, reported outcomes are going to be an essential component. And I think our new version of the STS database will facilitate that, and I'm excited about being a part of that type of future research. In addition to that, we are planning a prospective trial for TAVR in adolescents through young adults with three device companies. And so that's exciting um, in the clinical realm as well. Other questions? Very good.